Chris Stein, and I am with DEQ's Water Quality Program in Eugene. I'm the 401 Project Manager for the J.C. Boyle Project on the Planet River. Okay. Here. <clears throat> and we're here this evening to discuss the draft water quality decision, certification decision, for actions related to the removal of J.C. Boyle Dam and all related hydroelectric facilities. In California, the State Water Resources Control Board is currently conducting a similar review for their, their, and their evaluation for the proposed removal of the three dams in, in California. And on Thursday of last week, uh, the State Water Board issued its draft water quality certification decision as well. If ultimately approved by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, dam removal is expected to begin in January 2021. DEQ has prepared its draft certification in response to a request by the Klamath River Renewal Corporation, or the KRRC. KRRC is a nonprofit organization formed in early 2016 to serve as the decommissioning contractor. And I want to be very clear that DEQ is not directing KRRC to remove the dams, but rather DEQ is evaluating KRRC's proposal and its prescribed conditions necessary to ensure that the project will comply with state standards. <clears throat> DEQ understands that dam removal will temporarily lower water quality. Drawdown of the reservoir is expected to take about two months, during which suspended sediment loads will be high, which may also temporarily affect other water quality parameters, including dissolved oxygen. Once drawdown is complete, however, the effects of dam removal will quickly decrease uh, as sediment loads are reduced and downstream water quality begins to reflect incoming water quality conditions. In 2012, DEQ adopted rules regarding dam removal. Specifically, the rule allows DEQ to establish a time schedule for meeting compliance objectives, provided the action will result in improved water quality and a net ecological benefit. We believe these criteria have been met. The draft certification establishes a compliance time schedule of two years, after which we, we, we expect the project will not result in exceedances to water quality standards. The certification places strict conditions on the activity to man, minimize the duration of impacts to water quality. So tonight, I will briefly discuss the proposed action, a summary of our evaluation, and some of the conditions that we will provide in the certification. And I will then open the floor to questions from the audience. The project that operates today is owned and operated by Pacific Core Energy and was constructed between 1903 and 1962. In February 2010, Pacific Core, California, Oregon, Department of Interior, NOAA Fisheries, local tribes and more than 40 stakeholders entered into the Klamath Hydroelectric Settlement Agreement. Uh, the agreement was amended in April of 2016. The agreement establishes a framework that could lead to the removal of the Klamath River dams. To do this, the agreement requests to first designate the lower dams as the Lower Klamath Project in its own license and transfer that license to the KRRC Finally, it requests for it to issue a surrender and decommissioning order, which would authorize the removal of the project. Anticipating that FERC will eventually transfer the license, KRC has filed applications with Oregon and California uh, for Section 401 water quality certification. DEQ has completed our draft cert certification and has until September 10, 2018, to issue its final order. So what exactly has KRC proposed? The KR KRC proposes to permanently remove all physical project elements, including the dam, reservoir, power canal, powerhouse, transmission lines, and recreational facilities associated with the lower plan of the project. Rock material from the dam embankment will be placed in the nearby borrow pit, where this material was originally mined. 
The concrete debris and other material will be used to restore the large erosional scour hole on the canyon near the canal emergency spillway. KRC also proposes a number of measures to protect fish and other aquatic resources, revegetate and stabilize reservoir sediments, <clears throat> manage waste materials, monitor and mitigate for impacts to affected resources and other restoration activities. These actions may all directly or indirectly result in impacts to water quality, but clearly the principal impacts are related to the release of sediment that will occur during reservoir drawdown and, and the removal of the dam. J.C. Boyle stores about one million cubic yards of sediment behind the dam. There we go. Depending on flows that occur during the first year, uh, between 40 to 60 percent of the sediment stored behind the dam is expected to move downstream. The sediment is very fine-grained, and most of the sediment is, is, is expected to remain in the water column and flow completely to the estuary and into the Pacific. Because the material is so soft, this, set, this suspended sediment will remain uh, suspended for the duration of drawdown. JC, uh, the sediment concentrations will peak during the first three months, as shown here in this, in this graph. Uh, this is a graph of model sediment uh, transport during the, during the first two years of drawdown. As you can see, it peaks very, very abruptly during drawdown, but then uh, tails off rapidly afterwards. Sediment movement during the second year will likely be much lower than during initial drawdown. Based on models of sediment transport, DEQ reasonably expects that any redistribution of these sediments beyond the second year will be minor and will not reduce water quality. The expected short-term effects include high suspended sediment loads, high turbidity, and, and temporarily depressed dissolved oxygen. The long-term effects include cooler seasonal temperatures once the reservoir and hydropower operation effects are removed from the project, increased dissolved oxygen in the bypass reach, reduced suspended sediment, and water quality parameters consistent with seasonal variation under a natural flow regime. A number of factors exist that may shorten this period of reduced water quality. These include a comparatively small volume of material that's, that's located behind J.C. Boyle Land. In contrast, more than 14 million cubic yards of sediment is expected to be released from uh, Copco 1 and Iron Gate Reservoirs in California. The project is also located in the steepest section of the entire Klamath River. This will aid in sediment mobility and improve oxygenation. The, set, the, the drawdown is expected to begin in January during a period of high, highest seasonal uh, flow, which will also aid in transport. And the colder water temperatures during drawdown will improve oxygen saturation and reduce biological activity that may reduce water quality. So what conditions will DEQ require on the certification? Principal condition uh, includes the establishment of a time compliance schedule. Uh, DEQ has est established a time schedule of 24 months, after which we expect the effects will not uh, result in exceedances to water quality standards. As you see here in this graph, uh, which is about a two-year time duration, uh, much of the suspended sediment is expected to be, uh, uh, is, to, is expected to lower down below 10 milligrams per liter, which is quite low, and almost consistent with, with, uh, with background levels. The, uh, the time schedule for compliance is consistent with the objectives of the Clean Water Act, which include restoring the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the of, of impaired water bodies. A rule adopted by DEQ in 2012 recognizes that short-term discharges may be necessary to meet the objectives of the Clean Water Act. A central element of the 401 requires KRC to prepare and implement a water quality management plan. Water quality monitoring is an essential component of any action to assess whether the project has, has uh, met its objectives. KRC is required to perform these actions 
the report results directly to DEQ. DEQ will require KRC to monitor water quality for a minimum of four years at three locations. The first location is at an existing USGS gauging site below Kino Dam. The second location is also at a, at a USGS station below J.C. Boyle uh, Powerhouse. And the third location will be uh, located for this project at the California Oregon State Line. KRC must install instrumentation at these sites to provide continuous measurements for a number of water quality parameters. And we will also require uh, periodic samples at these locations for suspended sediment, nutrients, and other parameters related to this, uh, to this project. Last, DEQ will require all data to be submitted to us annually for review. The 401 also includes protections for biological resources. These include actions to ensure that fish passage is maintained during restoration. The 401 requires KRC to remedy obstructions that may be caused by exposed culverts, shifting sediment, or exposed buried objects. Uh, the 401 also requires uh, certain aquatic resource measures to protect endangered species in the area, including the short-nosed and lost river suckers that live in and around J.C. Boyle Reservoir. And it also includes measures for the protection of uh, western pond turtles that are also known to exist within this area. 401 also requires a number of resource management plans to ensure that the actions that are the actions performed are consistent with the ones evaluated by DEQ. These include a reservoir drawdown plan. Uh, the, the plan described, should describe a schedule and methodology for drawdown and contingency measures for actions that may delay uh, drawdown procedures. The forum will also include a requirement for a reservoir uh, management Reservoir drawdown to expose portions of the reservoir floor. DEQ will require KRC to develop and implement a plan to ensure that exposed soils are revegetated and stabilized and, uh, to reduce bankside erosion uh, and reduce sources of long term sediment input. We will also, um, the, the 401 also includes a uh, requirement for a site restoration plan. Uh, this plan will, will, will require a detailed proposal to restore portions of the project in a way that provide long-term protection against erosion and instability. The condition requires development of a sediment and erosion control plan that addresses restoration and monitoring actions in many areas including the borrow pit, the spillway scour hole, recreation areas, power canal, and the tailways below the powerhouse. Last, the, the 401 will require a waste disposal management plan. The DEQ directs KRC to develop procedures to identify, manage, and properly dispose of waste materials. These may include hazardous wastes, such as paints, oils, asbestos, or other materials in buildings and in existing equipment. The plan should also address management of solid wastes uh, such as rebar, wood, tires, asphalt, or building materials. So, what happens if our expectations regarding this 401 are not met? I would, I would start by saying that, that DEQ expects the effects of dam removal will not adversely affect water quality after complete, completion of the compliance time schedule. DEQ believes this is realistic based on the modeling results under a variety of flow conditions that show that suspended sediment concentrations will decrease sharply, as shown in this graph, in the first year following drawdown. We also believe that restoration activities may be completed in a manner that ensures long-term stability. If these expectations are not met, the certification does allow DEQ to require additional measures as necessary to ensure uh, to, re to reduce long-term impact. For example, if monitoring demonstrates that reservoir soils contribute to excess sediment in the river, the, the certification requires KRC to adapt restoration activities to improve bankside stabilization. Other measures may include KRC to uh, conduct a, a 
effects analysis to determine if project actions harm beneficial uses. These and other effects of the project will be evaluated by DEQ based on monitoring efforts required by this certification and reviewed by DEQ in annual reports. I encourage you all to review our evaluation and findings report and our draft water quality certification. The best way to view the documents is by following the link provided in the public notice. Oh, up behind me, uh, there. There's the restoration. There's our, there's our contract information. Uh, if you need additional information or have questions regarding the project, please contact me directly. We are currently accepting public comments on the findings of our evaluation and our draft certification. Comments may be submitted to DEQ by mail, fax, or email, but must be received by 5 p.m. on Friday, July 6th. You may also have the opportunity to provide oral comments during a public hearing that follows the question and answer session tonight, or hand-delivered written comments to any of our staff here this evening. So, with that, I will open the floor to questions from the audience. Yes. Uh, Eric, do you want to hand the mic? Yeah. I think that might be best. presentation. Um, the first slide was a map of the project reach. Uh, let's go back to that. Thank you. Right there. I'm curious to know why the other three dams are within the project reach if this is simply the removal of JC Boyle Dam and not the others. Uh, implementable as a, as a whole, if that makes any sense. 
It does. You mentioned the Iron Gate Dam being taken out under California's jurisdiction. Can you say the same thing about the Calco dams? Correct. Okay, so speak, we're speaking about all four dams. Because this is a bicameral project, can you say a little bit about the California side of this meeting, the purpose of this meeting? Will California have a similar meeting for their side of the project? What I understand is that uh, they are, they have issued their draft certification this past Thursday, date that is, but for a 45 day public comment period that goes until late July. My understanding is that they are not planning uh, a public hearing such as we are. California also has a CEQA uh, process, a parallel process that is a comprehensive environmental, uh, uh, statewide environmental review process. They will, uh, they have not yet completed their CEQA document. That will be done, I don't want to speak for them, but I, I've been told it will be done in September. Um, and they have also indicated that their 401 and CEQA documents will be finalized sometime uh, in the middle part of the next year. Um, as far as I know, they are not planning a public hearing for their 401. They are accepting public comments, as are we, um, but, we but we are having a public hearing. I, I don't know if that, I, not that confuses the issue. No, <laughs> good clarification, thank you.
the fielder dam, or, or sorry, 302 feet, I'm sorry, on the, the uh, Bill Gray Dam, the fielder dam was 273 feet in berth. Now that's not a creek. It had over a mile of lake behind it. The estimated sediments behind that were a little over, when they first said it, 34,000 uh, yards, cubic yards. Um, it ended up in their nearest figures of going over 69,000 cubic yards. That was behind a dam on a creek. The reason I'm here or seeing, because I've been following this up and down, been to a lot of the meetings. Um, I lived over here in Plymouth years ago, back in the 70s, and been up and down and seen the rivers and the dams and the stuff that's been evolved. But I'm concerned because I've worked at two of the, the dams on, on the climate. I did asbestos removal. I did some core sampling. And some of the sediments that I found and what I found in them was almost as bad as Fielder Dam, which was on a creek. By the way, the four number one concerns of Fielder Dam, and I, I'm comparing this and why, why I'm asking this question. What I found behind the Fielder Dam was mercury, arsenic, and they were substance quantities, yet that wasn't the bad stuff. The bad stuff was the PCB oil, and then the actual um, material. Well, the, the sediments they found, and some of them were a little bit bigger pieces of uranium. Now, those are all things we should worry about, especially the PCB oil, because I tracked backwards to the War Eagle Mine, which was above Evans Creek, um, where they destroyed um, power plants, or you know, they put it in the creek, they, just, they let it run, and that's how it got down behind um, the Fielder Dam. But I'm curious, you know, you guys probably did sediment sampling. Um, I've seen the results, was it 10 years ago, of some of the sediments that they found behind uh, Iron Gate. And I've also worked on Iron Gate, did asbestos work and removal there. Um, inside the plant, even when it was running. Um, but I'm also, I'm going to back up a little bit, I did sampling and cores at Bonneville. I've also done lead inspections at Bonneville, 200 and some feet down the cavity of the uh, turbine. What I'm concerned with, that we have levels of other chemicals that you say in the first year, a bigger, bigger percentage is going to move. Okay, when they removed, and I'm going to go over one other dam, when they removed gold gray, the sediments that they didn't remove, when they got out in the water with all this equipment, and they were supposed to have a 401, a 201, and a 404 permit, they failed the process, DEQ failed the process of having people there monitoring. Now, I understand, and I'm not trying to pick on them, when you say you have people out there monitoring, do they go once a week? Once a month during the process, I met the people at Fielder, and my concerns were at Fielder that they didn't come back until the dam was out. They didn't come back and start doing samples until then. I got even core samples after that found chemicals way above the numbers. Now these are small dams. These are small, what do you call it, walls or whatever you want to call it. But when all this is happening, this is, if I understand correctly, this is about having the clean water movement and about the fish. Um, when they did the fielder dam, I have pictures of hundreds of thousands of coho salmon, fingerlings, above that dam that suffocated and baked and cooked in the little ponds that were left over when they started breaking the wall out. I was asked to do what I did because it was by the owners who owned the dam. When Water Watch did their project, and these other people were supposed to be paying attention to this, including DEQ, I was concerned that the chemicals, and they, they, they showed the oil, the film, for days that went over that dam. You guys are going to do a big project. You're going to expect most of it to move. The majority of the stuff from Gold Ray is still down in 80 feet of holes and pockets in Grants Pass right by the water treatment plant. These chemicals are not just sediments that flow easy. They're magnetics. 
Does it, have any of you people that have done this, if, if you've done the geology study in Oregon, and I, again, I'm not trying to, to out, you know, outrank or anything like that, I'm concerned that when they talk about taking a dam out that's been there for 100, 60, 70, 80 years, they have no idea of the other things that are there because they haven't looked at the geology. In the, the prospect of Oregon over the last 200 years, I'm a researcher, by the way, I'm a hazardous waste technician. The things that I've seen and the samples that I have a right to take as an inspector, what I find and send to outside accredited labs do not match what all these other people are saying. I don't work for the government. I'm by myself. I've paid for all my samplings. They're accredited labs. I'm just concerned that when you pull the plug and where this stuff is going to go, where it's actually, you know, each one of the dams is going to hit, and, and when it does, the sediments, the sediments are magnetic. They're not going to move like a lot of people anticipate. The sharpness or the height of the dam, are you familiar with the Condon Dam in, in Washington State? Maybe you just can let him answer the monitor, okay. the sediment question, and then come back to that. I'll give you the microphone back. Okay, well, one is the Condon Dam. Did you see that one when it was exploded with dynamite? Did you see how fast it moved? Oh, yes. It was so dramatic. How quick it got to the Columbia, <laughs> along with thousands of fish? Chris, perhaps you could talk about the monitoring and the sediments. Sure. Well, you know, um, you know, you're you're describing one uh, uh, a dam removal that I was not involved with. Uh, but what I can speak to is the sediment work that was done to support the secretarial determination uh, of, of uh, for the removal of the of the dams here. Uh, uh, in, terms of, in terms of grain size. Uh, the findings suggest that the, 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 the material is, is exceptionally fine grain and will remain suspended for effectively the duration that it takes to wash out uh, beyond the estuary. Uh, in terms of, of, of chemical composition, uh, the, the compounds that were detected were, and I'm summarizing very broadly here because the, uh, you know, the, the, this is the this is the result of numerous sediment core samples from, uh, taken from transects across all of the reservoirs. But the generalized findings from, the, from those studies suggested that the, the chemical composition present in those sediments was virtually indistinguishable from terrestrial background levels that would be found in and around uh, the, the reservoir uh, locations themselves. What that tells us is that, that much of the material that is there in the base of the reservoirs, impounded by the, uh, by, impounded by the dams, is, is uh, uh, material that has been washed uh, uh, through erosional processes uh, collected by the dams that are that is effectively that effectively reflects uh, background levels of the uh, surrounding area. Um, that they were also compared with appropriate screening levels, the risk-based screening levels, um, and then a few instances where where uh, where uh, those levels were exceeded, um, they were also they were they were reflected of those background uh, background soils. So what I'm what the, the information that I have in in, in, in summary. Of the information that I have to base our decision on is is the uh, the sum total of the of the, uh, uh, the sediment work that was done from during the federal studies to support the secretarial determination, and these were studies that were done over a period of years. If there's additional information that you may have that pertains to uh, uh, sediment quality behind J.C. Boyle, I'd love to see. I did even even behind uh, Iron Gate. Even behind Iron Gate. I mean, I, I've been down there when I was doing asbestos uh, uh, removal on main lines and cores inside the plant um, when they had to be repaired or replaced. Um, you have to suit up. You have to do different things. And I took samples. I took core samples during my lunch break instead of taking lunch. But the things I was finding are very parallel to the other geology studies um, that have been done well over 150 years ago. Most of Oregon 
As far as I know, according to the Orbans under the Geology Department, the, the booklet that's put out by the state, um, it's broken every quadrant, which is a half mile in size, um, thousands of samples taken inside of each one of those quadrants to know that you have arsenics, the type of arsenics, the actually uranium. Um, the climate area, well, if you know the area a little bit over there, you're going out towards Lakeview, they have open pit uh, uranium removal over there. That's one of the only open pit mines in the United States. And yet, it's all over where we are, and nobody's paying attention to that. I was getting reads of 0 0.08 parts rad when even, even taking the sediment samples, let them dry a little bit in the sun, and they were taken off. Um, I understand you know, that we want to do this project. We want to go through it. The one thing I would say to you about all this stuff that's happening, now, I've sat out there for hours, 12 hours at a time, watching the people that are supposed to be there monitoring. I'll be straight up with you. I have a problem with it. I'm a professional, and I hope they are, but I don't see it when how they're doing it, they don't show up for 10 minutes, they take a sample and gone. When the dravidity is so bad that you can't see a half inch down, even when they did the dams over in Rogue River, and the chemicals that were there, it went out into it, and I mean, the fish that died and everything else, I thought it was about the fish, but more importantly to you, when they want to do these projects, knowing that there's a hydro plant behind it, Oregon, and the West Coast has some of the highest levels of cancer throughout the United States. In our area, because of those minerals and chemicals that are there, we have both, um, we have the blood cancer here, um, and we have uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Some of the highest in numbers, whether you mark that as not or say it doesn't have anything to do with the water, I will tell you that I'm that person that found the hexavalent chromium the water in Grants Pass on the river, which came from the Kodak plant in Jackson County. I tracked it backwards. That's what my job is as a hazmat guy. I didn't do it because I wanted a button or a pin. I just did it because we are, have, we are losing children with, with radon poisoning. We are losing them with non Hodgkin's lymphoma. The aftermath may not come now, but in a year or two, if this stuff doesn't wash down to the ocean, and, and blow itself out. The Condit Dam is an example. 86 feet of sediment. And they figure maybe 300,000 cubic yards went through the hole at the Condit Dam when they blew it. And the rest of it stayed. And it's still terrible looking there. And that's how many years ago now? I just hope in the decision to do this that they cover all the bases. Even though I understand the state, they're not responsible, they're trying to do it the best they can. I've known people within the state DEQ for 20 years, and a lot of them disagree with some of the steps, because the bottom line, it's not just about the work they're doing. I'm a stakeholder. Do you know what they're taking out of my power bill to move these dams? Yes, I'm a stakeholder. Everybody in the state of Oregon is a stakeholder. Because in our area, I live in Grants Pass and I'm paying for it. And the power that comes from those is not directly relative to Grants Pass. It comes out of Bonneville. I understand a little bit more, but I, I'm just really worried about how. One last question. What's the window of time that they figure all four of these dams are going to start being taken out to the finish? What's the, what's the period? What's the period of time? Uh, well, there will be, uh, J.C. Boyle will be begin to be drawn down on January 1st, 2021, or at least that's the schedule. The schedule. So it's not like next year or something like that? No, 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 no. It'll, begin, it'll begin in 2021. Uh, the, the schedule's been advanced here, but that's the, the current thing. Now, is this good? One last question. Are these going to be drawn to Congress to make this final decision? Not the power company because at the, the uh, Pacific Power meeting, the only town hall meeting they've had in our area in the state was actually across the border in California, April 2nd, five years ago. I was there and I listened to the whole project, three hours worth of the testimony, the people from Pacific Power and from down in California coming and saying 
what was happening, what was going on, and why the power, and, and the different aspects, aspects of it, and talking about the $80 million they needed to take these dams out. But in essence, they have $37 million set aside right now from our power bills. All of us are paying as customers, and we're not the one, that, we didn't gain the money from it, the power company did. They should be paying for it, not us. And where our tax dollars, or our regular living dollars, are out of our, and on our power bill, we're paying for this. I understand. So I I'd like Chris to be able to address that and then ask if anyone else has questions, and I'm sure you have a follow-up question. Well, I'll, I'll address one question you had earlier uh, that I, I think I can, that is well within our, our, our uh, authority. I think you had some, some concerns about uh, what you believed were inadequate monitoring actions that occurred on certain dam removal projects. And, and again, I, I, I don't have any information about that. What I do have information is about what we will require on this project. Um, and and that, that is the establishment of, 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 of three, uh, three sites, three sites in Oregon. <coughs> California uh, undoubtedly has their own monitoring requirements. And they have a longer section of, of river that is affected by the action. Um, uh, we have some, we will require a, a water quality monitoring plan to be developed that it was submitted to us and, and approved by us. Um, that will provide for that that monitoring action. Now, you you are uh, <clears throat> DEQ does not do that monitoring. That monitoring is the obligation of the permittee or the licensee in this in this case that is issued a water quality certification. So there that is an enforceable action that must be performed in accordance with the measures of the water quality management plan. Um, that there's, uh, there are continuous measurements from SONs placed at the three locations, and there are periodic uh, grab samples to be collected at each of those locations as well. Uh, I think it's a fairly rigorous monitoring uh, program, one that encompasses the above, above, below, and state line locations that are sufficient to determine whether uh, to, to answer the principal question of when is the project no longer contributing to water quality violations. So, uh, you know, that, that's, my feeling is it's a well-designed monitoring program. It is the obligation of the, the licensee to, to execute that, but it will be done with our oversight and in coordination with us. That is, is, is how, that, that's how this project would work. Um, do I have any additional questions from this section or from the general department? the opportunity uh, or the follow-up to answer this gentleman's question about the frequency, in other words, the interval of samples. What is the time between samples in these three sessions? Oh, that's a very good question. Thanks. Uh, there's two types of samples. One, one is uh, continuous monitoring that will be done from instrumentation, permanently placed instrumentation in the river. Uh, water quality signs that will be collecting when I say continuous, they're usually uh, every hour, but they're averaged over you know sub-hour intervals. So we have more or less continuous records of uh, basic water quality parameters such as temperature, turbidity, dissolved oxygen, pH, conductivity, those types of water quality measurements. Um, wet chemistry. Uh, type samples uh, have to be collected manually and analyzed in the laboratory. Um, I think I have the intervals written down, but they are prescribed in the certification that is available. If I recall correctly, they're weekly for the first, let me put it this way, they're weekly for the first period of time, um, several months, they are um, Correct. Yeah. 
the interval starts out short. <laughs> Chris, maybe we can look that up during the, yeah, the I, break. I, 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 yeah. uh, but I, but I, your question is well taken. The interval of sampling is, uh, uh, is, is dense during the initial drawdown. Then it, it reverts to uh, every other week for a period of time, and then it's monthly thereafter. Because um, and I think this, this uh, diagram bears this out. Uh, let's face it. A lot of activity is occurring during those first, uh, those first few months. There's an awful lot of action going on. And we want to have denser sampling uh, during that period of time to capture that, uh, uh, the dynamics of the, of the drawdown. But in the middle portion, particularly when the, the flows begin to recede a little bit, the seasonal flows, um, the, the, the period of uh, sampling uh, stretches out a little bit. And then after, I believe it's October 1st, it goes to a monthly sampling. Just but, quickly. Uh, those, those, those exact uh, figures are available in the form. Okay. Uh, just curious to know if California is going to adhere to the same frequency intervals as Oregon? Um, I have not looked at the draft certification issue by the way. We have talked extensively about aligning our frequency and duration, and for that matter, a lot of the parameters, so that it was it, so that the uh, the project as a whole uh, can be implemented a little bit more easily, and that the data collected from the entire project will be more meaningful. That said, California is free to issue what is what is appropriate for their state rules. Oregon is uh, free to issue what's appropriate for our state rules. But to the extent that we can align those things, we, we did uh, we worked very, very closely to make sure that those were as, line, uh, as aligned as possible. So because of the size of the room and how long we have the room, I'd like to um, stop the Q&A around 7.15. So I just want to give about another 20 minutes or so. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't get to come this morning, but it, it, the questions, and I understand there's different people working on different projects. Um, the things that I noted on the two dams that were moved just on the creek, and given the volume, um, there was a point of time that 30,000 cubic uh, feet per second were running over the dam. Um, when they started, blowing the wall or taking the cap off when they started to punch a couple little holes where it leaked. The sediment went kind of wild. And the sediment uh, depth was about 27 feet deep, going back almost a mile. But when they were doing the testing, like you say, the monitoring, I'll give you a couple of examples. At the first one, and I'm not trying to pick on somebody, DEQ did not show up until after the dam was gone. And then they said turbidity was fine. They never came before. They didn't do it. They didn't do the samples. I, my point is, if you don't know what's there before it starts moving, and then they start blowing a wall out, and then you get births of oil, different types of sheens of chemicals, whether it's um, uh, arsenic or anything like that, or PCB oil, the people that were doing the project, and I, I did my serious research on them. Number one, they didn't have I guess we would say all their ducks in a row. They didn't do all the sampling in the windows. At the end, well, they were two days into pulling the dam, then the second one, the fielder, and the guy that was running the show from Water, um, Water Watch came down and said that, take that bucket, go down and get a sample and bring it back, and we'll test it. That's not how you do sampling. I was surprised that I never seen Nielsen Laboratories, which does most of the sampling all over the state and through the other states around us. There's another very qualified water lab, Grants Pass Water Lab. They showed up and the turbidity was off the map. The chemicals, the oil slicks, the foam, the difference of oil, petroleum, diesel, um, antifreeze, it, it, was, it was, even the arsenic was accounted for, yet, the way they were doing the samples, and I, I, I believe that you're going to do it differently with a project like this. But that took center stage.
to almost 600,000 cubic yards of four of the bad players that were in the valley behind it. I did the research, I went backwards, I've been going back and forth in there since 96, and know of some of the, the areas that goes on. You can't have a company come in when they say they're licensed, they're bonded. Even the state of Oregon won't back that up. They didn't have a CCB license, they didn't have a license to do demo, they didn't have insurance, they didn't have bonds. And you know what their answer to all that was? When they didn't do the sampling right? Because I was questioning it because I bounced straight. And I know the hexavalent and chromium's there. Well, we're a nonprofit. We don't have to. Now, state won't answer my questions about their ability to remove, to be licensed, to be bonded, because none of them work. And I would leave it at that. I just hope if you're doing these projects and given that window and time out, there's hundreds of thousands of people over in Clarence, and a lot of them I know, and some of them down below. In the, going across into Wairika in that area of the Iron Gate. If they're going to do this, I sure hope they do it right because all God's glory is going to come down on this mess if it doesn't get done right, if they even attempt to do it and the president says it's okay. I'm not sure I heard a question in there, and I know that you're signed up to comment. Um, did Thank you, you want to. Thank you, you for allowing me. Um, did you want to address anything further on that front? No, I mean, I, it's a separate project, and I, I, I hear your comment. I appreciate that you're doing what you're doing. Um, do I have any additional questions? Um, and, sir, did you have any additional questions? I know that you're signed up to comment, and um, uh, we can certainly open the hearing panel and um, be available for questions afterward. I guess one question that you have. Will they use... Hold on, let me get to you. Will they use the accredited labs that we have in our community so the money floats around, not just goes to one group of people and on that project? I mean, it needs to be open. If this is, a, if this is the public putting into this and paying these bills, the people within the community ought to be able to recoup some of that money and making sure because they do good jobs the same as the other people do. Uh, well, DEQ is not prescribing which lab to use. Uh, that's, that's, that's not a typical part of our, uh, a typical requirement of our, of our certifications. Uh, but I, I, I hear what you're saying that All components of this must be uh, performed in, in a manner and, and using using laboratories that are that are uh, that can provide the level of analytical precision that the product requires. So I, I, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, again, we're going to go ahead and open the formal comment period unless anyone else has questions at this point. Um, and Chris's business card is outside on the table. The details of the public notice are also there. We, the comment period will run through July 6th. And I'll go ahead and hand it over to Eric. Record 
Today is Tuesday, June 12th, and it is 7 o'clock p.m. We are at the Oregon Institute of Technology at 3201 Campus Drive in Klamath Falls. I'll call on people to comment in the order they've signed up. This meeting is being recorded, and by signing up to comment, you are consenting to be recorded. DEQ will consider comments to the extent that our authority allows. Please be aware you may raise issues that are outside DEQ's scope of authority. You can also submit written comments via fax, email, or U.S. mail. The details on how to do this are included in the public notice document, which is available at the sign-up table outside the door. Written comments have the same weight as any comments provided during this hearing, and DEQ will be accepting comments through 5 p.m. on July 6, 2018. After the comment period closes, DEQ will consider all comments received. I'll now begin calling names of people who have signed up to speak. If at any time during this hearing you decide you want to make an oral comment, please fill out a card and bring it to Chris Stein. Okay. And I have only one card, and that's Alan Ely. Alan, here. Correct. So I'll, I will bring this up to you. Sorry, I didn't plan this. <laughs> no problem. Questions when they were doing sampling with the other dam removals and how this project's going to work. Um, when they removed the um, Condit Dam, when they blew the hole in it, I know that uh, well, their nearest figures were 86 feet of uh, from the bottom where they punched the hole to the top of sediment. I know that. What they figured about 30 to 35,000 cubic yards made it through the hole like a jet taken off. But when it was all done, I don't know if you've ever seen the video of that, um, it stayed around. I mean, the rains, the almost like a tar pitch. My concern is our area in southern Oregon has a lot more magnetics, and I understand the fine the fine particle that's there, but are they taking into consideration that some of the stuff is just flat going to linger because it is magnetics and it's going to hold a lot of the other sediment. We have irons, different ores um, throughout southern Oregon. Um, I, I know that it covers a vast area. The lists are 80 or 90 different minerals and the, the types, but what we have in our area is very would you say, homegrown to our area, and the system, the way they want to do this, may be a lot different than what they're planning and how it actually moves. And this, the figure in two years, um, some of it went down to the ocean from here, and some of it's still in 80-foot deep holes. And that's a lot of material that actually dark in color and magnetic does not help the fish or the purity of the water. That's what my concern is, move, removing these dams and knowing what's above climate. All right, thank you. And at this point, I don't have slips from anyone else. Has anyone uh, given us a slip to make a comment that we've not acknowledged? through 5 p.m. on July 6, 2018. Thank you for attending today's hearing and for taking the time to share your comments with DEQ.